Welcome back, everyone, to our Classic Tales live reading of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. I am your narrator, Libba Beecham, Director of Media and Communications here at the Northeast Georgia History Center in the Cottrell Digital Studio. And we are on part five so far, so if you're just joining us, uh, please go back to our part one so you can get the full story. And uh, just to catch us up, we did have to stop uh, in the middle of a chapter last time due to our time constraints. But <clears throat> to catch us up, our protagonist, Mr. Uh, Monsieur Aranex, uh, who is also the voice of the story, has just learned quite a lot about the details and the mechanics and the science behind this vast submarine ship, the Nautilus, and has uh, met and had conversations with its uh, captain, Captain Nemo, who still has quite a bit of mystery surrounding him, but is nonetheless a very interesting character and one that um, I think we're going to learn more and more about, uh, perhaps in this chapter. Now, uh, Monsieur Aranax has just come back to um, his friends and counterparts, uh, Ned Land and his uh, servant Conceal, so I'm going to back up a little bit so we can get back into the scene where we were. So Mr. Aranax has just left the company of Captain Nemo and has come back um, to where Ned Land and Conceal are. So let's journey on. I'm just going to check my audio real quick to make sure we are good to go. Uh, perhaps in this chapter now. Ah, okay. I see I need to make one adjustment with my, my audio. It's not picking up my mic, so please hold for just a second. I'm going to go back to our holding screen for just a moment. All right, I'm going to do a quick audio check that should be a clearer audio now that it's coming from my wireless mic. So let's just check on that before we get started. And thank you all for coming back and joining us. I'm really enjoying this story. Let's see, just waiting for the delay on Facebook and YouTube so I can make sure our audio is good to go. While we are waiting, uh, we I did want to let you know that we have... Uh, officially announced our digital membership so you can become a digital member for as slow as three bucks a month or 35 for the year okay good sounds like our audio is good and I'll remind you about that at the end of our session today as well um, but I'll leave a link in the uh, in the chat um, where you can sign up become, to become a digital member and receive invites to exclusive members-only live streams, special podcast episodes, and video lessons, as well as our newsletter. All right, now that we're ready, let's dive on in again. So this is um, Monsieur Aranax just coming in um, to talk to Ned Land and Conceal. My friends, I answered, making a sign for them to enter. You are not, not in Canada, but on board the Nautilus, 50 yards below the level of the sea. But Monsieur Aranax, said Ned Land, can you tell me how many men there are on board? 10, 20, 50, 100? I cannot tell you, Mr. Land. It is better to abandon for a time all idea of seizing the Nautilus or escaping from it. This ship is a masterpiece of modern industry, and I should be sorry not to have seen it. Many people would accept the situation forced upon us, if only to move amongst such wonders. So be quiet, and let us try and see what passes around us. See, exclaimed the harpooner, but we can see nothing in this iron prison. We are walking, we are sailing blindly. Ned Land had scarcely pronounced these words when all was suddenly darkness. The luminous ceiling was gone, and so rapidly that my eyes received a painful impression. We remained mute, not stirring, and not knowing what surprise awaited us, whether agreeable or disagreeable. A sliding noise was heard. One would have said that panels were working at the sides of the Nautilus. 
It is the end of the end, said Ned Land. Suddenly, light broke at each side of the saloon through two oblong openings. The liquid mass appeared vividly lit up by electric gleam. Two crystal plates separated us from the sea. At first, I trembled at the thought that this frail partition might break, but strong bands of copper bound them, giving an almost infinite power of resistance. The sea was distinctly visible for a mile all around the Nautilus. What a spectacle! What pen can describe it? Who could paint the effects of the light through those transparent sheets of water and the softness of the successive gradations from the lower to the superior strata of the ocean? We know the transparency of the sea and that its clearness is far beyond that of rock water. The mineral and organic substances which holds it in suspension heightens its transparency. In certain parts of the ocean, in the Antilles, under 75 fathoms of water can be seen with surprising clearness a bed of sand. The penetrating power of the solar rays does not seem to cease for a depth of 150 fathoms. But in the middle fluid traveled over by the Nautilus, the electric brightness was produced even in the bosom of the waves. It was no longer luminous water, but liquid light. On each side, a window opened into the unexplored abyss. The obscurity of the saloon showed to advantage the brightness outside, and we took and we looked out as if this pure crystal had been the glass of an immense aquarium. You wish to see Fred Ned, <laughs> friend Ned? Well, you see now. Curious, curious, muttered the Canadian, who, forgetting his ill temper, seemed to submit to some irresistible attraction. And one would come further than this to admire such a sight. Ah, thought I to myself, I understand the life of this man. He has made a world apart for himself in which he treasures all his greatest wonders. For two whole hours, an aquatic army escorted the Nautilus. During their games, their bounds, while rivaling each other in beauty, brightness, and velocity, I distinguished the green labor, the banded mullet the, marked by a double line of black, the round-tailed goby of white color with violet spots on the back, the Japanese scrombus, a beautiful mackerel of these seas, with a blue body and silvery head, the brilliant azurors, whose name alone defies description, some banded spares with variegated fins of blue and yellow, the woodcock of the seas, some specimens of which attain a yard in length, Japanese salamanders, spider lampreys, serpents six feet long, with eyes small and lively, and a huge mouth bristling with teeth, with many other species. Our imagination was kept at its height. Interjections followed quickly on each other. Ned named the fish and concealed class them. I was in ecstasies with the vivacity of their movements and the beauty of their forms. Never had it been given to me to surprise these animals, alive and at liberty, in their natural element. I will not mention all the varieties which pass before my dazzled eyes, all the collection of the seas of China and Japan. These fish, more numerous than the birds of the air, came attracted, no doubt, by the brilliant focus of the electric light. Suddenly, there was daylight in the saloon, the iron panels closed again, and the enchanting vision disappeared. But for a long time I dreamt on till my eyes fell on the instruments hanging on the partition. The compass still showed the course to be E in E. The manometer indicated a pressure of five atmospheres, equivalent to the depth of 25 fathoms, and the electric log gave a speed of 15 miles an hour. I expected Captain Nemo, but he did not appear. The clock marked the hour of five. Ned Land and Conceal returned to their cabin, and I retired to my chamber. My dinner was ready. It was composed of turtle soup made of the most delicate hawk bills of sur mullet served with puff paste, the liver of which, prepared by itself, was most delicious, and fillets of the emperor holocanthus, the savor of which seemed to me superior even to salmon. I passed the evening reading, writing, and thinking. Then sleep overpowered me, and I stretched myself on my couch of zoostera and slept profoundly. 
whilst the Nautilus was gliding rapidly through the current of the Black River. Curious what Zostera, okay, there's an offer. All right, on to, this is chapter 14, A Note of Invitation. The next day was the 9th of November. I awoke after a long sleep of 12 hours. Conceal came, according to custom, to know how I passed the night and to offer his services. He had left his friend, the Canadian, sleeping like a man who had never done anything else all his life. I let the worthy fellow chatter as he pleased without caring to answer him. I was preoccupied by the absence of the captain during our sitting of the day before and hoping to see him today. As soon as I was dressed, I went into the saloon. It was deserted. I plunged into the study of the shell treasures hidden behind the glasses. The whole day passed without my being honored by a visit from Captain Nemo. The panels of the saloon did not open. Perhaps they did not wish us to tire of these beautiful things. The course of the Nautilus was E in E, her speed 12 knots, the depth below the surface between 25 and 30 fathoms. The next day, 10th of November, the same desertion, the same solitude. I did not see one of the ship's crew. Ned and Conceal spent the greater part of the day with me. They were astonished at the puzzling absence of the captain. Was this singular man ill? Had he altered his intentions with regard to us? After all, as Conceal said, we enjoyed perfect liberty. We were delicately and abundantly fed. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Our host kept to his terms of the treaty. We could not complain, and indeed the singularity of our fate reserved such wonderful compensation for us that we had no right to accuse it as yet. That day I commenced the journal of these adventures, which has enabled me to relate them with more scrupulous exactitude and minute detail. 11th November, early in the morning, the fresh air spreading over the interior of the Nautilus told me that we had come to the surface of the ocean to renew our supply of oxygen. I had directed my steps to the central staircase and mounted the platform. It was six o'clock, the weather was cloudy, the sea gray but calm, scarcely a billow. Captain Nemo, whom I hoped to meet, would he be there? I saw no one but the steersman imprisoned in his glass cage, seated upon the projection formed by the hall of the penance. I inhaled the salt breeze with delight. By degrees, the fog disappeared under the, under the action of the sun's rays. The radiant orb rose from behind the eastern horizon. The sea flamed under its glance like a train of gunpowder. The clouds scattered in the heights were colored with lively tints of beautiful shades and numerous mare's tails, which betokened wind for that day. But what was wind to this nautilus which tempests could not frighten? I was admiring this joyous rising of the sun, so gay and so life-giving, when I heard steps approaching the platform. I was prepared to salute Captain Nemo, but it was his second, whom I had already seen on the captain's first visit, who appeared. He advanced on the platform, not seeming to see me. With his powerful glass to his eye, he scanned every point of the horizon with great attention. This examination over, he approached the panel and pronounced a sentence in exactly these terms. I have remembered it, for every morning it was repeated under exactly the same conditions. It was thus worded, Natron respak lorni virk. What it meant, I could not say. These words pronounced, the second descended. I thought that the Nautilus was about to return to its submarine navigation. I regained the panel and returned to my chamber. Five days sped thus, without any change in our situation. Every morning I mounted the platform, the same phrase was pronounced by the same individual, but Captain Nemo did not appear. I had made up my mind that I should never see him again, when on the 16th of November, on returning to my room with Ned and Conceal, I found upon my table a note addressed to me. I opened it impatiently. It was written in a bold, clear hand, the characters rather pointed, recalling the German type. The note was worded as follows. To Professor Aranax on board the Nautilus, 16th of November, 1867. Captain Nemo invites Professor Aranax to a hunting party, which will take place tomorrow morning in the forests of the island of Crespo. He hopes that nothing will prevent the professor from being present, and he will with pleasure see him joined by his companions. Captain Nemo, commander of the Nautilus. 
a hunt, exclaimed Ned. And in the forests of the island of Crespo, added Conceal. Oh, then the gentleman is going on terra firma, replied Ned Land. That seems to be clearly indicated, said I, reading the letter once more. Well, we must accept, said the Canadian. But once more on dry ground, we shall know what to do. Indeed, I shall not be sorry to eat a piece of fresh venison. Without seeking to reconcile what was contradictory between Captain Nemo's manifest aversion to islands and continents and his invitation to a hunt in a forest, I contended myself with replying, Let us first see where the island of Crespo is. I consulted the planisphere, and in 3240 northern latitude and 15750 west westerly longitude, I found a small island recognized in 1801 by Captain Crespo and marked in the ancient Spanish maps as Roca de la Plata, the meaning of which is the silver rock. We were then about 1800 miles from our starting point. And the course of the Nautilus, a little changed, was bringing it back towards the southeast. I showed this little rock lost in the midst of the North Pacific to my companions. If Captain Nemo does sometimes go on dry ground, said I, he at least chooses desert islands. Ned shrugged his shoulders without speaking and conceal, and he left me. After supper, which was served by the steward, mute and impassive, I went to bed, not without some anxiety. The next morning, the 17th of November, on awakening, I felt the Nautilus was perfectly still. I dressed quickly and entered the saloon. Captain Nemo was there, waiting for me. He rose, bowed, and asked me if it was convenient for me to accompany him. As he made no allusion to his absence during the last eight days, I did not mention it, and simply answered that my companions and myself were ready to follow him. We entered the dining room where breakfast was served. Monsieur Aranax, said the captain, pray share my breakfast without ceremony. We will chat as we eat, for though I promised you a walk in the forest, I did not undertake to find hotels there. So breakfast has a man who will most likely not have his dinner till very late. I did honor to the repast. It was composed of several kinds of fish and slices of sea cucumber and different sorts of seaweed. Our drink consisted of pure water, to which the captain added some drops of a fermented liquor extracted by the Kamstracha method from a seaweed known under the name of Rhodomina palmata. Captain Nemo ate at first without saying a word. Then he began. Sir, when I proposed to you to hunt in my submarine forest of Crespo, you evidently thought me mad. Sir, you would never judge lightly of any man. But, Captain, believe me. Be kind enough to listen, and you will then see whether you have any cause to accuse me of folly and contradiction. I listen. You know as well as I do, Professor, that man can live underwater, providing he carries with him a sufficient supply of breathable air. In submarine works, the workman, clad in an impervious dress, with his head in a metal helmet, receives air from above by means of forcing pumps and regulators. That is a diving apparatus, said I. Just so, but under these conditions the man is not at liberty. He is attached to the pump which sends him air through an India rubber tube, and if we were obliged to be thus held to the Nautilus, we could not go far. And the means of getting free, I asked. It is to use the Roquayal apparatus, invented by two of your own countrymen, which I have brought to perfection for my own use, and which will allow you to risk yourself under these new... Uh, physiological conditions without any organ whatever suffering. It consists of a reservoir of thick iron plates in which I store the air under a pressure of 50 atmospheres. This reservoir is fixed on the back by means of braces, like a soldier's knapsack. Its upper part forms a box in which the air is kept by means of a bellows, and therefore cannot escape unless at its normal tension. In the rock royal apparatus such as we use, two India rubber pipes leave this box and join a sort of tent which holds the nose and mouth. One is to introduce fresh air, the other to let out the fowl, and the tongue closes one or the other according to the wants of the respirator. But I, in encountering great pressures at the bottom of the sea, was obliged to shut my head like that of a diver in a ball of copper. And it is th to this ball of copper that the two pipes, the inspirator and the expirator, open. Perfectly, Captain Nemo, but the air you carry with you must soon be used. When it only contains 15% of oxygen, it is no longer fit to breathe. 
Right, but I told you, Monsieur Aranax, that the pumps of the Nautilus allow me to store the air under considerable pressure. And on those conditions, the reservoir of the apparatus can furnish breathable air for nine or ten hours. I have no further objections to make, I answered. I will only ask you one thing, Captain. How can you light your load at the bottom of the sea? With the Rookmorph, with the Rumkorf apparatus, Monsieur Aranax, one is carried on the back, the other is fastened to the waist. It is composed of a Bunsen pile, which I do not work with uh, bichromate of, of potash, but with sodium. A wire is introduced which collects the electricity produced and directs it towards a particularly made lantern. In this lantern is a spiral glass which contains a small quantity of carbonic gas. When the apparatus is at work, the gas becomes luminous, giving out a white and continuous light. Thus provided, I can breathe and I can see. Captain Nemo, to all my objections, you make such crushing answers that I dare no longer doubt. But if I am forced to admit the Rock Royal and Rumkorf apparatus, I must be allowed some reservations with regard to the gun I am to carry. But it is not a gun for powder, answered the captain. Then it is an air gun? Doubtless, how would you have me manufacture gunpowder on board without either sulfur or charcoal? Besides, I added, to fire underwater in a medium 855 times denser than the air, we must conquer very considerable resistance. That would be no difficulty. There exist guns, according to Fulton, perfected in England by Philip Coles and Burley, in France by Fiercy, and in Italy by Landi which are furnished with a peculiar system of closing, which can fire under these conditions. But, I repeat, having no powder, I use air under great pressure, which pumps, which the pumps of the Nautilus furnish abundantly. But this air must be rapidly used. Well, have I not my Rochoyal Reservoir, which can furnish it at need? A tap is all that is required. Besides, Monsieur Aronnax, you must see yourself that, during our submarine hunt, we can spin but little air and but few balls. It seems to me that in the twilight and in the midst of this fluid, which is very dense compared with the atmosphere, shots could not go far, nor easily prove mortal. Sir, on the contrary, with this gun every blow is mortal, and however lightly the animal is touched, it falls as if struck by a thunderbolt. Why? Because the balls sent by this gun are not ordinary balls, but little cases of glass. These glass cases are covered with a case of steel and weighted with a pellet of lead. They are real leaden, leaden bottles, into which the electricity is forced to a very high tension. With the slightest shock, they are discharged, and the animal, however strong it may be, falls dead. I must tell you that these cases are size number four, and that the charge for an ordinary gun would be ten. I will argue no longer, I replied, rising from the table. I have nothing left I have nothing left me but to take my gun. At all events I will go where you go. Captain Nemo then led me aft, and in passing before Ned's and Conceal's cabin, I called my two companions, who followed promptly. We then came to a cell near the machinery room, in which we put on our walking dress. Chapter 15, A Walk on the Bottom of the Sea. Well, I'm looking forward to this chapter. Just seeing how we're doing here. All right, great. We'll continue on. This cell was, to speak correctly, the arsenal and wardrobe of the Nautilus. A dozen diving apparatuses hung from the partition waiting our use. Ned Land, on seeing them, showed evident repugnance to dress himself in one. But, my worthy Ned, the forests of the island of Crespo are nothing but submarine forests. Good, said the disappointed harpooner, who saw his dreams of fresh meat fade away. And you, Monsieur Aranax, are you going to dress yourself in those clothes? There is no alternative, Master Ned. As you please, sir, replied the harpooner, shrugging his shoulders. But as for me, unless I am forced, I am never get into one. I will never get into one. No one will force you, Master, Le Master Ned, said Captain Nemo. Is Conceal going to risk it? asked Ned. I follow my master wherever he goes, replied Conceal. 
At the captain's call, two of the ship's crew came to help us dress in these heavy and impervious clothes, made of India rubber without seam, and constructed expressly to resist considerable pressure. One would have thought it a suit of armor, both supple and resisting. This suit formed trousers and waistcoat. The, the trousers were finished off with thick boots, weighted with heavy leaden soles. The texture of the waistcoat was held together by bands of copper, which crossed the chest, protecting it from the great pressure of the water, and leaving the lungs free to act. The sleeves ended in gloves. Ooh, my computer's running a little slow. One second. which in no way restrained the movement of the hands. There was a vast difference noticeable, no, noticeable between these consummate apparatuses and the old cork breastplates, jackets, and other contrivances in vogue during the 18th century. Captain Nemo and one of his companions, a sort of Hercules who must have possessed great strength, Conceal and myself were soon enveloped in the dresses. There remained nothing more to be done but to enclose our heads in the metal box, but before proceeding to this operation, I asked the captain's permission to examine the guns. One of the Nautilus men gave me a simple gun, the butt end of which, made of steel, hollow in the center, was rather large. It served as a reservoir for compressed air, which a valve, worked by a spring, allowed to escape into a metal tube. A box of projectiles and a groove in the thickness of the butt end contained about twenty of these electric balls, which, by means of a spring, were forced into the barrel of the gun. As soon as one shot was fired, fired, another was ready. Captain Nemo, said I, this arm is perfect and easily handled. I only ask to be allowed to try it, but how shall we gain the bottom of the sea? At this moment, Professor, the Nautilus is stranded in five fathoms, and we have nothing to do but to start. But how shall we get off? You shall see. Captain Nemo thrust his head into the helmet. Conceal and I did the same, not without hearing an ironical good sport from the Canadian. The upper part of our dress terminated in a copper collar upon which was screwed the metal helmet. Three holes protected by thick glass allowed us to see in all directions by simply turning our head in the interior of the headdress. As soon as it was in position, the Rochoyal apparatus on our backs began to act, and for my part, I could breathe with ease. With the Rumcorf lamp hanging from my belt and the gun in my hand, I was ready to set out, but to speak the truth, imprisoned in these heavy garments and glued to the deck by my leaden soles, it was impossible for me to take a step. But this state of things was provided for. I felt myself being pushed into a little room contiguous to the wardrobe room. My companions followed, towed along the same way. I heard a watertight door furnished with stopper plates close upon us, and we were wrapped in profound darkness. After some minutes, a loud hissing was heard. I felt the cold mount from my feet to my chest, evidently from some part of the vessel they had, by means of a tap, given entrance to the water, which was invading us and with which the room was soon filled. A second door cut inside of the Nautilus then opened. We saw a faint light. In another instance, our feet trod the bottom of the sea. And now, how can I retrace the impression left upon me by that walk under the waters? Words are impotent to relate such wonders. Captain Nemo walked in front. His companion followed some steps behind. Conceal and I remained near each other as if an exchange of words had been possible through our metallic cases. I no longer felt the weight of my clothing or my shoes of my reservoir of air or my thick helmet, in the midst of which my head rattled like an almond in its shell. The light, which lit the soil thirty feet below the surface of the ocean, astonished me by its power. The solar rays shone through the watery mass easily and dissipated all color, and I clearly distinguish objects at a distance of a hundred and fifty yards. Beyond that, the tints darkened into fine gradations of ultramarine and faded into vague obscurity. Truly, this water which surrounded me was another air denser than the terrestrial atmosphere, but almost as transparent. Above me was the calm surface of the sea. We were walking on fine, even sand, not wrinkled, as on a flat shore, which retains the impression of billows. This dazzling carpet, really a reflector, repelled the rays of the sun with wonderful intensity, which accounted for the vibration which penetrated every atom of liquid. 
Shall I be believed when I say that at the depth of thirty feet I could see as if I was in broad daylight? For a quarter of an hour I trod on this sand sown with the impalpable dust of shells. The hull of the Nautilus, resembling a long shoal, disappeared by degrees, but its lantern, when darkness should overtake us in the waters, would help to guide us on board by its distinct rays. Soon forms of objects outlined in the distance were discernible. I recognized magnificent rocks hung with a tapestry of zoophytes of the most beautiful kind, and I was at first struck by the peculiar effect of this medium. It was then ten in the morning, the rays of the sun struck the surface of the waves at rather an oblique angle, and at the touch of their light decomposed by refraction as through a prism, flowers, rocks, plants, shells, and polypi were shaded at the edges by seven solar colors. It was marvelous, a feast for the eyes. This complication of colored tints, a perfect kaleidoscope of green, yellow, orange, violet, indigo, and blue. In one word, the whole palette of an enthusiastic colorist. Why could I not communicate to conceal the lively sensations which were mounting to my brain and rival him in expressions of admiration? For aught I knew, Captain Nemo and his companion might be able to exchange thoughts by means of previously agreed upon. So, for want of better, I talked to myself. I declaimed in the copper box which covered my head, thereby expending more air in vain words than perhaps was wise. Various kinds of isis, clusters of pure tuft coral, prickly fungi, and anemones formed a brilliant garden of flowers, decked with their colorettes of blue tentacles, sea stars studding the sandy bottom, it was a real grief to me to crush under my feet the brilliant specimens of mollusks which strewed the ground by thousands of hammerheads, uh, donasi, veritable bounding shells, of staircases and red helmet shells, angel wings, and many others produced by this inexhaustible ocean. But we were bound to walk, so we went on, whilst above our heads waved Medusa, whose Medusa, whose umbrellas of opal or rose pink, escalloped with a band of blue, sheltered us from the rays of the sun and fiery pelagi, which in the darkness would have strewn our path with phosphorescent light. All these wonders I saw in the space of a quarter of a mile, scarcely stopping and following Captain Nemo, who beckoned me on by signs. Soon the nature of the soil changed. To the sandy plain succeeded an extent of slimy mud, which the Americans call ooze, composed of equal parts of silicious and calcareous shells. We then traveled over a plain of seaweed, of wild and luxuriant vegetation. This sward was of close texture and soft to the feet, and rivaled the softest carpet woven by the hand of man. But whilst vendor was spread at our feet, it did not abandon our heads. A light network of marine plants of that inexhaustible family of seaweeds, of which more than 2,000 kinds are known, grew on the surface of the water. I noticed that the green plants kept near the top of the sea, whilst the red were at a greater depth, leaving to the black or brown the care of forming gardens and parterres in the remote beds of the ocean. We had quitted the Nautilus about an hour and a half. It was near noon. I knew by the perpendicularity of the sun's rays, which were no longer refracted. The magical colors disappeared by degrees, and the shades of emerald and sapphire were effaced. We walked with a regular step, which rang upon the ground with astonishing intensity. The slightest noise was transmitted with a quickness to which the ear is unaccustomed on earth. Indeed, water is a better conductor of sound than air in the ratio of four to one. At this period, the earth sloped downwards. The light took a uniform tint. We were at a depth of 105 yards and 20 inches, undergoing a pressure of six atmospheres. At this depth, I could still see the rays of the sun, though feebly. To their intense brilliancy had succeeded a reddish twilight, the lowest state between day and night. But we could still see well enough. It was not necessary to, us to resort to the Rumcorf apparatus as yet. At this moment, Captain Nemo stopped. He waited till I joined him, and then pointed to an obscure mass looming in the shadow at a short distance. It is the forest of the island of Crespo, thought I, and I was not mistaken.
All right, let's continue on to chapter 16. A Submarine Forest. We had arrived at last on the borders of this forest, doubtless one of the finest of Captain Nemo's immense domains. He looked upon it as his own and considered he had the same right over it that the first men had in the first days of the world. And indeed, who would have disputed with him the possession of this submarine property? What other hardier pioneer would come hatchet in hand to cut down the dark copses? This forest was composed of large tree plants, and the moment we penetrated under its vast arcades, I was struck by the singular position of their branches, a position I had not yet observed. Not an herb which carpeted the ground, not a branch which clothed the tree was either broken or bent, nor did they extend horizontally, all stretched up to the surface of the ocean. Not a filament, not a ribbon, however thin they might be, but kept as straight as, an, as a rod of iron. The fuci and lianas grew in rigid perpendicular lines due to the density of the element which had produced them. Motionless yet, when bent to one side of the hand, they directly resumed their former position. Truly, it was the region of perpendicularity. I soon accustomed myself to this fantastic position, as well as the comparative darkness which surrounded us. The soil of the forest seemed covered with sharp blocks difficult to avoid. The submarine flora struck me as being very perfect and richer even than it would have been in the Arctic or tropical zones, where these productions are not so plentiful. But for some minutes I involuntarily confounded the genera, taking animals for plants, <laughs> and who would not have been mistaken, the fauna and the flora are too closely allied in this submarine world. These plants are self-propagated, and the principle of their existence in the water which, it, which upholds and nourishes them. The greater number, instead of leaves, shoot forth blades of capricious shapes, comprised within a scale of colors pink, carmine, green, olive, fawn, and brown. Curious anomaly, fantastic element, said an ingenious naturalist, in which the animal kingdom blossoms and the vegetable does not. In about an hour, Captain Nemo gave the signal to halt. I, for my part, was not sorry, and we stretched ourselves under an arbor of alaray, the thin, long blades of which stood up like arrows. This short rest seemed delicious to me. There was nothing wanting but the charm of conversation, but impossible to speak, impossible to answer. I only put my great copper head to conceals. I saw the worthy fellow's eyes glistening with delight, and to show his satisfaction, he shook himself in his breastplate of air in the most comical way in the world. After four hours of this walking, I was surprised not to find myself dreadfully hungry. How to account for this state of the stomach, I could not tell. But instead, I felt an insurmountable desire to sleep, which happens to all divers. And my eyes soon closed behind the thick glasses, and I fell into a heavy slumber which the movement alone had prevented before. Captain Nemo and his robust companion, stretched in clear crystal, set us this, the example. How long I remained buried in the, this drowsiness I cannot judge, but when I awoke the sun seemed sinking towards the horizon. Captain Nemo had already risen, and I was beginning to stretch my limbs when an unexpected apparition brought me briskly to my feet. A few steps off, a monstrous sea spider, about 38 inches high, was watching me with squinting eyes, ready to spring upon me. Though my diver's dress was thick enough to defend me from the bite of this animal, I could not help shuddering with horror. Conceal and the sailor of the Nautilus awoke at this moment. Captain Nemo pointed out the hideous crustacean, which a blow from the butt end of his gun knocked over, and I saw the terrible claws of the monster writhe in terrible convulsions. This instant incident reminded me that other animals, more to be feared, might hunt, haunt these obscure depths, against whose tax my diving dress would not protect me. I had never thought of it before, but now I resolved to be upon my guard. Indeed, I thought that this halt would mark the termination of our walk, but I was mistaken, for instead of returning to the Nautilus, Captain Nemo continued his bold excursion. The ground was still on the incline. Its declivity seemed to be getting greater and to be leading us to greater depths. 
It must have been about three o'clock when we reached a narrow valley between high perpendicular walls situated about 75 fathoms deep. Thanks to the perfection of our apparatus, we were 45 fathoms below the limit which nature seems to have imposed on man as to his submarine excursions. I say 75 fathoms, though I had no instrument by which to judge the distance, but I knew that even in the clearest waters the solar rays could not penetrate further, and accordingly the darkness deepened. At ten paces not an object was visible. I was groping my way when I suddenly saw a brilliant white light. Captain Nemo had just put his electric apparatus into use. His companion did the same, and Conceal and I followed their example. By turning a screw, I established a communication between the wire and the spiral glass, and the sea, lit by our four lanterns, was illuminated for a circle of thirty-six yards. As we walked, I thought the light of our Rumkorf apparatus could not fail to draw some inhabitant from its dark couch, but if they did approach us, they at least kept at a respectable distance from the hunters. Several times I saw Captain Nemo stop, put his gun to his shoulder, and after some moments drop it and walk on. At last, after about four hours, this marvelous excursion came to an end. A wall of superb rocks and an imposing mass rose before us, a heap of gigantic blocks, an enormous steep granite shore, forming dark grot grottoes, but, with, but which presented no practical, cr practical slope. It was the prop of the island of Crespo. It was the earth. Captain Nemo stopped suddenly. A gesture of his brought us all to a halt, and however desirous I might be to scale the wall, I was obliged to stop. Here ended Captain Nemo's domains, and he would not go beyond them. Further on was a portion of the globe he might not trample upon. The return began. Captain Nemo had returned to the head of his little band, directing their course without hesitation. I thought we were not following the same road to return to the Nautilus. The new road was very steep and consequently very painful. We approached the surface of the sea rapidly, but this return to the upper strata was not so sudden as to cause relief from the pressure too rapidly, which might have produced serious disorder in our organization and brought on internal lesions so fatal to divers. Very soon light reappeared and grew, and the sun being low on the horizon, the refraction edged the different objects with a spectral ring. At ten yards and a half deep, we walked amidst a shoal of little fishes of all kinds, more numerous than the birds of the air, and also more agile. But no aquatic game worthy of a shot had as yet met our gaze, when at that moment I saw the captain shoulder his gun quickly and, a follow, and follow a moving object into the shrubs. He fired. I heard a slight hissing and a creature fell stunned at some distance from us. It was a magnificent sea otter, and in an inhydrus, the only exclusively marine quadruped. This otter was five feet long and must have been very valuable. Its skin, chestnut brown above and silvery underneath, would have made one of those beautiful furs so sought after in the Russian and Chinese markets. The fineness and the luster of its coat would certainly fetch 80 pounds. I admired this curious mammal, with its rounded head ornamented with short ears, its round eyes and white whiskers like those of a cat, with webbed feet and nails and tufted tail. This precious animal, hunted and tracked by fishermen, has now become very rare and taken refuge chiefly in the northern parts of the Pacific, or probably its race would soon become extinct. Captain Nemo's companion took the beast, threw it over his shoulder, and we continued our journey. For one hour, a plain of sand lay stretched before us. Sometimes it rose to within two yards and some inches of the surface of the water. I then saw our image clearly reflected, drawn inversely, and above us as appeared an identical group reflecting our movements and our actions, in a word, like us in every point, except that they walked with their heads downward and their feet in the air. Another effect I noticed, which was the passage of thick clouds which formed and vanished rapidly, but on reflection I understood that these seeming clouds were due to the varying thickness of the reeds at the bottom, and I could even see the fleecy foam which their broken tops multiplied on the water, and the shadows of large birds passing above our heads, whose rapid flight I could discern on the surface of the sea. 
On this occasion, I was witness to one of the finest gunshots which ever made the nerves of a hunter thrill. A large bird of great breadth of wing, clearly visible, approached, hovering over us. Captain Nemo's companion shouldered his gun and fired when it was only a few yards above the waves. The creature fell stunned, and the force of its fall brought it within the reach of dexterous hunter's grasp. It was an albatross of the finest kind. Our march had not been interrupted by this incident. For two hours we followed these sandy plains, then fields of algae very disagreeable to cross. Candidly, I could no more when I saw a glimmer of light which, for half a mile, broke the darkness of the waters. It was the lantern of the Nautilus. Before twenty minutes were over, we should be on board, and I should be able to breathe with ease, for it had seemed that my reservoir supplied air very deficient in oxygen. But I did not reckon on an accidental meeting, which delayed our arrival for some time. I had remained some steps behind when I presently saw Captain Nemo coming hurriedly towards me. With his strong hand, he bent me to the ground, his companion doing the same to conceal. At first I knew not what to think of this sudden attack, but I was soon reassured by seeing the captain lie down beside me and remain immovable. I was stretched on the ground just under the shelter of a bush of algae when, raising my head, I saw some enormous mass casting phosphorescent gleams pass blusteringly by. A blood, my blood froze in my veins as I recognized two formidable sharks which threatened us. It was a couple of tintories, tintories, let's see, terrible creatures, Tintori okay, no, no definition provided, okay, tintories, terrible creatures with enormous tails and a dull glassy stare, the phosphorescent matter ejected from holes pierced around the muzzle, monstrous brutes, which would crush a whole man in their iron jaws. I did not know whether Conceal stopped to classify them. For my part, I noticed their silver bellies and their huge mouths bristling with teeth from a very unscientific point of view, and more as a possible victim than a naturalist. Happily, the voracious creatures do not see well. They passed without seeing us, brushing us with their brownish fins, and we escaped by a miracle from a danger certainly greater than meeting a tiger full face in the forest. Half an hour later, Guided by the electric light, we reached the Nautilus. The outside door had been left open and Captain Nemo closed it as soon as we had entered the first cell. He then pressed a knob. I heard the pumps working in the midst of the vessel. I felt the water sinking from around me, and in a few moments the cell was entirely empty. The inside door then opened and we entered the vestry. There our diving dress was taken off, not without some trouble, and fairly worn out from want of food and sleep, I returned to my room in great wonder at the surprising excursion at the bottom of the sea. All right, let us continue. This is chapter 17, 4,000 Leagues Under the Pacific. And let's see here. Oh, where is my mouse? There we go. See, we've got a question. Oh, I see, okay. <laughs> Let us continue. The next morning, the 18th of November, I had quite recovered from my fatigues of the day before, and I went up onto the platform just as the second lieutenant was uttering his daily phrase. I was admiring the magnificent aspect of the ocean when Captain Nemo appeared. He did not seem to be aware of my presence and began a series of astronomical observations. Then, when he had finished, he went and leant on the cage of the watchlight and gazed abstractedly on the ocean. In the meantime, a number of sailors of the Nautilus, all strong and healthy men, had come up onto the platform. They came to draw up the nets that had been laid all night. These sailors were evidently of different nations, although the European type was visible in all of them. I recognized some unmistakable Irishmen, Frenchmen, some, some Sclaves, and a Greek, or a Candiote. They were civil and only used that odd language among themselves, the origin of which I could not guess, neither could I question them. 
The nets were hauled in. They were a large kind of shallots, like those on the Normandy coast, great pockets that the waves and the chain fixed in the smaller meshes kept open. These pockets drawn by iron poles swept through the water and gathered and everything in their way. That day they brought up curious specimens from those productive coasts. I reckon that the hull ha had brought in more than 900 weight of fish. It was a fine haul, but not to be wondered at. Indeed, the nets are let down for several hours and enclose in their meshes an infinite variety. We had no lack of excellent food, and the rapidity of the Nautilus and the attraction of the electric light could always renew our supply. These several productions of the sea were immediately lowered through the panel to the steward's room, some to be eaten fresh, fresh and others pickled. The fishing ended, the provision of air renewed. I thought that the Nautilus was about to continue its submarine excursion and was preparing to return to my room when, without further preamble, the captain turned to me saying, Professor, is not this ocean gifted with real life? It has its tempers and its gentle moods. Yesterday it slept as we did, and now it has woke after a quiet night. Look, he continued, it wakes under the caresses of the sun. It is going to renew its diurnal existence. It is an interesting study to watch the play of its organization. It has a pulse, arteries, spasms, and I agree with the learned Hamari who discovered in it a circulation as real as a circulation of blood in animals. Yes, the ocean has indeed circulation, and to promote it, the Creator has caused things to multiply in it, caloric salt and animal an, animalculi. When Captain Nemo spoke thus, he seemed altogether changed and aroused an extraordinary emotion in me. Also, he added, true existence is there, and I can imagine the foundations of nautical towns, clusters of submarine houses, which, like the Nautilus, would ascend every morning to breathe at the surface of the water, free towns, independent cities. Yet, who knows whether some despot... Captain Nemo finished his sentence with a violent gesture, then addressing me as if to chase away some sorrowful thought. Monsieur Aranax, he asked, do you know the depth of the ocean? I only know, Captain, what the principal soundings have taught us. Could you tell me them so that I can suit them to my purpose? These are some, I replied, that I remember. If I am not mistaken, a depth of 8,000 yards has been found in the North Atlantic and 2,500 yards in the Mediterranean. The most remarkable soundings have been made in the South Atlantic near the 35th parallel and they give 12,000 yards, 14,000 yards, and 15,000 yards. To sum up all, it is reckoned that the bottom, if the bottom of the sea were leveled, it, its mean depth would be about one and three quarter leagues. Well, Professor, replied the captain, we shall show you better than that, I hope. As to the mean depth of this part of the Pacific, I tell you it is only 4,000 yards. Having said this, Captain Nemo went towards the panel and disappeared down the ladder. I followed him and went into the large drawing room. The screw was immediately put in motion and the log gave 20 miles an hour. During the days and weeks that passed, Captain Nemo was very sparing of his visits. I seldom saw him. The lieutenant pricked the ship's course regularly on the chart so I could always tell exactly the route of the Nautilus. Nearly every day, for some time, the panels of the drawing room were opened, and we were never tired of penetrating the mysteries of the submarine world. The general direction of the Nautilus was southeast, and it kept between 100 and 150 yards of depth. One day, however, I, don't, I do not know why, being drawn diagonally by means of the inclined planes, it touched the bed of the sea. The thermometer indicated a temperature of 4.25 centigrade, a temperature that at this depth seemed common to all latitudes. At three o'clock in the morning of the 26th of November, the Nautilus crossed the Tropic of Cancer at 172 degrees longitude. On the 27th instant, it sighted the Sandwich Islands, where Cook died February 14, 1779. It had, we had then gone 4,860 leagues from our starting point. In the morning when I went on the platform, I saw two miles to windward Hawaii, the largest of the seven islands that form the group. I saw clearly the cultivated ranges and the several mountain chains that run parallel with the side and the volcanoes that overtop 
Mountain Ray, uh, Moon Array, which, raise, which rise 5,000 yards above the level of the sea. Besides other, other things the nets brought up were several flabelli ray and graceful polypi that are peculiar to that part of the ocean. The direction of the Nautilus was still to the southeast. It crossed the equator December 1st in 142 degrees longitude. And on the fourth of the same month, after crossing rapidly and without saying, and without anything in particular occurring, we sighted the Marquesas group. I saw three miles off Martin's Peak in Nukahiva, the largest of the group that belongs to France. I only saw the woody mountains against the horizon because Captain Nemo did not wish to bring the ship to the wind. There, there the nets brought up beautiful specimens of fish, some with azure fins and tails like gold, the flesh of which is unrivaled, some nearly destitute of scales but of exquisite flavor, others with bony jaws and yellow-tinged gills as good as bonitos, all fish that would be of use to us. After leaving these charming islands protected by the French flag, from the 4th to the 11th of December, the Nautilus sailed over about 2,000 miles. During the daytime of the 11th of December, I was busy reading in the large drawing room. Ned Land and Conceal watched the luminous water through the half-opened panels. The Nautilus was immovable. While its reservoirs were filled, it kept at a depth of 1,000 yards, a region rarely visited in the ocean, and in which large fish were seldom seen. I was then reading a charming book by Jean Mace, The Slaves of the Stomach, and I was learning some valuable lessons from it when Conceal interrupted me. Will Master come here a moment, he said in a curious voice. What is the matter, Conceal? I want Master to look. I rose, went, and leaned on my elbows before the panes and watched. In full electric light, an enormous black mass, quite immovable, was suspended in the midst of the waters. I watched it attentively, seeking to find out the nature of this gigantic cetacean. But a sudden thought crossed my mind. A vessel, I said half aloud. Yes, uh, yes, replied the Canadian, a disabled ship that has sunk perpendicularly. Ned Land was right. We were close to a vessel of which the tattered shrouds, shrouds still hung from their chains. The keel seemed to be in good order, and it had been wrecked at most some few hours. Three stumps of masts broken off about two feet above the bridge showed that the vessel had, no, had to sacrifice its masts. But lying on its side, it had filled, and it was heeling over to port. This skeleton of what it had once been was a sad spectacle as it lay lost under the waves, but sadder still was the sight of the bridge where some corpses bound with ropes were still lying. I counted five, four men, one of whom was standing at the helm, and a woman standing by the poop, holding an infant in her arms. She was quite young. I could distinguish her features, which the water had not decomposed, by the brilliant light from the Nautilus. In one despairing effort, she had raised her infant above her head, poor little thing, whose arms encircled its mother's neck. The attitude of the four sailors was frightful, distorted as they were by their convulsive movements whilst making a last effort to free themselves from the cords that bound them to the vessel. The steersman alone, calm with a grave, clear face, his gray hair glued to his forehead, and his hand clutching the wheel of the helm seemed even then to be guiding the three broken masts through the depths of the ocean. What a scene. We were dumb. Our hearts beat fast before the shipwreck, taken as it were from life and photographed in its last moments. And I saw already coming towards it with hungry eyes, enormous sharks attracted by the human flesh. However, the Nautilus, turning, went round the submerged vessel, and in one instant I read on the stern, the Florida Sunderland. All right, we'll have to stop there for today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this, that was a, I really enjoyed the part where they go to the bottom of the sea, and it, I just... It was really interesting to think about the the plant, the tree-like plants uh, rising to meet um, the sun. Um, what a wonder! <laughs> and, uh, and now I'm quite curious about. It seems like we've left on a, a bit of a cliffhanger. Well, I, I wonder if we'll find out more about this the shipwreck and see if it's connected in any way um, to uh, to the Nautilus or not. We'll see. 
But uh, we will continue our adventure tomorrow at uh, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, yes, I did want to also mention that we do have our uh, digital memberships available. So I'm going to put a link to our digital memberships in the chat. And what that means is, um, so as a digital member starting May 27th, we will offer uh, members only content. That means live streams, special podcast episodes, video lessons, our newsletter. And uh, you can join, become a digital member for as low as $3 a month or uh, $35 for the whole year. If you can give more, we do encourage you to do so as uh, the donations that go toward our digital programs allow us to invite special guests here and, of course, to maintain high-quality programming for all of you. So um, do check out that link. I'll put it in the chat right now. There we go. And until tomorrow, uh, please stay safe and uh, please encourage your uh, friends and family to join us for our live streams. Today, uh, we have a, a really interesting live stream, The Rules of Duels. <laughs> Historian Glenn Kyle is going to be going over the um, how dueling came about, the history of it, the etiquette of it, the, the rules of it. And um, that's going to be really interesting. It's family friendly. Uh, there will be no violence. Uh, there will just be an, a, a lesson and demonstration um, uh, of how, how it would have gone down. <laughs> so uh, please attend that today at 2 p.m. Eastern. All right. Thank you very much. And we will see you next time.